Good evening, everybody, and welcome to What's Up, Cuz. I'm your host, Jason Palmer, along with my cousin, the coach himself, Lance C. Irving. Cuz, oh, how you doing, buddy? It's been a while. Man, what's up, cuz? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great, man. We finally got a full show. Man, good thing, but you didn't change shirts on me. What is uh what is that daily? So I am what's representing that? my college that I am so proud of. Chicago's old. I am a proud graduate and alumni of Daily College, baby. How about the Bulldogs representing the green and gold? You know what? I give it up for the Bulldogs. <laughs> but, uh, make sure you leave that shirt on when a uh, special guest comes on at seven o'clock. Don't run change. I don't want to see. I want to see Daily College. Okay. <laughs> You will see Daily College. I will keep this on throughout the duration of the show as I am representing all the city colleges of Chicago on this week's show, but especially my beloved Daily College over there on the southwest side, proud graduate of the class of 86. Love them so much, man. But how you been doing, man? Man, Jay, doing great. You know, it's almost time for the season, right? So dealing with different issues, this COVID is for real. Yeah. I mean – Coaching hasn't been the same. We're doing so many things different that we haven't had to do in the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, every day, bless you, every day is a different day. But, you know, we seem to be holding on okay, and I'm doing good. I'm still in great shape, i tell you that. You see, I'm representing my – well, I'm not going to say my, but I'm representing the Chicago Bulls. I know. I was going to say something, Mr. I, Detroit Pistons, but yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see you wearing some Bulls gear today. <laughs> I kind of like Mo Cheeks and I like Patrick Williams, the pick they got from Florida State. I think he's going to do well. So I decided, listen, let's represent the Chicago Bulls tonight. All right. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Well, for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to What's Up Cuz. We were created back in July to provide a sports format specifically for the African-American community in Chicago and abroad. And the show has really taken off here. We had a little break the last three or four weeks. We had some Bears Monday night games, so we had shortened shows and some other things. We were on a little vacation, but we are now back full throttle just as the college basketball is getting ready to start, and the NBA will be starting in a couple of weeks as well. But That's if true. you are joining us for the first time, please go ahead, download that app. If you're watching us on the app, Sports Zone Chicago, you can get that app on Google. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on iTunes. If you're watching us on our YouTube page, go ahead and subscribe to that page. That way you can watch not just this show, for all of the shows that we have. And if you're watching us on uh, Sports Zone Chicago on our Facebook Live, we thank you for watching there. Please go ahead and leave a comment throughout the show. We'll be posting comments throughout the show. And we've got a loaded show tonight because we got a loaded show. Do you want me to go through the guest list? Go through the guest list. <sighs> Who's on the guest <laughs> list? Because you sound excited. You've been excited all weekend. I, I, could... I, I like that drum roll in the uh, background. <laughs> Who's on the show? You were texting me last night at 1 a.m. I'm like, if you don't go to bed. <laughs> we got some great people on the show. So coming up at 6.30, we have NBA referee and Chicago native Mark Davis. Mark is going to join us. He is a guy we've been trying to get on the show for a while. Mark is going to talk to us about careers and officiating, how he got his start, and what it's like refereeing in the NBA and a lot of other stuff that, that those men and women do off the court as well. And, uh, you know, refereeing is close to my heart because I'm a referee as well in three different sports on the youth level and the college level. So I'm really, really, really excited about getting your boy Mark Davis on. Man, I'm happy to have Mark Davis on. You know, Mark and I grew up playing bitty basketball at the age of Lord, five or six. So I've been knowing Mark for years. And Mark is a 60-40 club member, Jay. Oh, he's you, one of them crazy people. You, the, you and my are the only two that didn't get in. Y'all need to get at us now. That's I, all I'm going to say. I didn't know he was one of them. We'll definitely he's, have to talk about he's that. He's one of us. He's <laughs> one of us. So Mark is going to join us at 630 at 7 o'clock. We have got the coach of Chicago's Big Ten team, Chris Collins, is going to join us, the head coach of the men's basketball team at Northwestern University. He's going to talk to us about what his team is looking like, what it's going to be like playing in the Big Ten, what it's going to be like playing, if you can play, <laughs> and playing during COVID. So Chris Collins, son of legendary Doug Collins, he's coming on the show at 7 o'clock, and I'm really excited to have Chris on too. 
I know you were excited about Chris. I said, Jay, I think we might have a chance to get Chris Col Collins. And you was like, come on, cuz, can we get him? Can we get him? So when I hit you last week and said we had him, oh, you were like, yes. You know, Chris <laughs> is a great guy. You know, his father, he comes from a really good family. He's a good person. He's he's a real good family friend. Him and Mikey, I think they played AAU oh, okay. back in the day. So him and Mikey grew up together. Mikey still talks to him quite frequently. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, going to love talking to Coach Chris. He's coming on at 7 o'clock. And then at 7.30, I told him we got a lot of load of show. We've got a buddy of mine, a fellow journalist. He works for Rivals.com. He he does some stuff for U of I. We're going to talk fighting the lion eye basketball at 7.30 with my boy Kendrick Prince. He's going to chime in and let us know what's going on down there in the central Illinois area. I can't wait to talk to him because I'm going to bring up the Iowa Hawkeyes to him, Iowa <laughs> Hawkeyes to Chris, and I want to see how tough my is when they come on the show. But that's all right, though. We'll see. See, here you are always starting stuff. We got a bunch of Big Ten people what? coming in, and here you are trying to start stuff. I'm not start. You know what, Jay? I have a good nickname. My family called me the instigator. You know, <laughs> all <accurate>. family <laughs> No, but I miss Maya. You know, Maya's like my little sister, so I have to make sure she's not feeling herself. Okay. So I, I, I want to see how tough she really is. Yeah, so we're we going to see how that go over as the show we'll goes on. Because I have one name for her, Napoleon Napo Harris. Oh, Lord. Here we one go. name. One anyway, name. so, you know, once again, thank you all for joining us. We do got a loaded show for you. And we also have da -da -da -da, our poll question. We can't forget about our poll question. We always have a great poll question. Remember, our show is being done in conjunction with the Chicago Crusader newspaper. They are the oldest weekly African-American newspaper in the city of Chicago with Miss Dorothy Lavelle and Sharon Fountain and our guy Sam and, and everybody else over there, Sally King, everyone over there at the Crusader. Thank you. And uh, we thank them for doing this show in conjunction with us. So check them out at chicagocrusader.com to keep up with all the news that's going on in the community. And they are sponsoring our poll question. You know what question we asked this week, Lance? Oh, you have some crazy poll <laughs> questions. Come on, let me hear it. Let me get my mind right. Hold on. Okay. So right, we I'm haven't right. really been talking, we haven't really been talking about the bulls on our show for a number of reasons. But we got a poll question because they did something here recently. Okay. And I said, let me take it to the people and see what they have to say. So here's our poll question. For this week, what do you think of the Bulls selecting Patrick Williams with the number four draft pick? Your choices are A, excellent choice, as he will help us win. B, I'm taking a wait and see approach. Or C, this was a terrible pick. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And remember, you can vote by going to ChicagoCrusader.com. What do you think? of the Bulls selecting Patrick Williams with the number four draft pick. So we'll start with you, Coach Lance. You, what did you think of the pick? You know what, Jay? I was going to hold my comment until Joseph Phillips came on because ah, Joseph can say something crazy. No way. But you know what, though? <laughs> I, I like the pick. You hmm. know, we played Florida State last year, and Coach Leonard Hamilton, he's, the, he's a great coach. He doesn't get enough credit mm -hmm. for the way his guys play. But mm -hmm. watching them on tape, Actually, they played us. I live scouted them when they played Purdue last year. Mm -hmm. I love them. He's six eight, maybe close to six nine. He's a good athlete. He can play one through four, maybe even some five. And the NBA is going to more versatile players. I'm not sure how much he'll help us as a rookie next year. But with that being said, though, for years to come, I think we're gonna look back and say, hey, the Bulls made a nice pick. Because if you really think about it. Other than the first three picks, nobody else really jumped off the page to you, right? Because we didn't have an NC2A tournament. So mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. the pick. I think he's going to do well with his size. And plus, I talked to Dennis Gates, who used to work in Florida State. Mm -hmm. And one mm -hmm. thing Dennis Gates says about him is that he's a great kid and a high-character guy. And I don't think you could go wrong with a great kid, a high-character guy, and he's tough. Okay. So here's my here's my take on it. What's your take? I, li I like the high character guys. It's good to know that he's a high character guy. Mm -hmm. It's good to know he's got a lot of heart. He's got a lot of hustle. But I think what I want to know, what the fans want to know, is can he play? 
James. <laughs> that is the determining factor in the NBA. You have to have talent. I know he has a lot of upside, but I think Bulls fans are weary of words like upside, high character guys, potential. We need to start winning basketball games. Now, if you're telling me this guy is going to come in and he's going to help us immediately start winning basketball games, then my choice is A, all day long is an excellent pick. What you didn't say was he's going to hurt the team that this was the wrong pick, so I can't pick C. So I'm going to go with B, a wait and approach. A wait and see approach is what I'm going to go with. I think based off of kind of what you told me, what I saw of the young man playing, he reminds me of someone who could be like a Taj Gibson when he was with the Bulls. And if that's the case, I'm cool with it, you know, because Taj would always go to the hole. He can get you rebounds. He can score. He can play solid defense. So if he comes with that type of game, Lance, and you put that with all the other pieces that the Bulls have on their team, I think it will be an excellent pick. But for now, I'm going to take the wait and see approach. I'm going to say this. You know what, Jay? The difference between him and Todd is this. He can handle the basketball, not that Todd couldn't. But mm -hmm. the young man can play some point. I watched him. Okay. He can handle and he can shoot. See, we're getting caught up in his stats, saying he mm -hmm. only averaged 9.3 points per game. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, he played on a team that probably, if the season would have went on, could have won a national championship. It was five guys on that team that averaged double figures. He was a shade under that. The 13th pick who played on his team, or 14th, he averaged 12.3. Those were some talented guys on that team. Mark this down. That man can play. And you know, if I didn't think he could play, oh, hey, well, I'll be the first to tell you, oh, <laughs> he can't true. play a lick. And you know how my friend, he can't play a lick. Same way when I call home and my mother used to tell me, oh, y'all suck today. So I learned that way. No, the, he's going to be a good player. Mark my words. All right. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Well, let's bring in our guest. He always gives us the news on what's current and what he's working on over there in the Chicago Crusader newspaper. He is the sports editor at Chicago Crusader. Our guy, Joseph Phillips. What's up, Joe? How you doing, man? What's up, guys? What's up, cuz? What's what up? What up, cuz? You know right off the bat, what's on that sweatshirt? NYPD? NYPD. Oh, oh, oh Lord, what you doing with the police stuff on my show, man? And what this is Chicago. We don't oh, my God. This what is, is Chicago. Oh, Lord, we just lost all our fans, man. Look at the people logging off now because of Joseph. Do you know about the Chicago, New York basketball battles? Yeah, I was in New York two weeks ago, man. <laughs> I want to hear this, It was really oh. nice. And uh, my son and I was walking through Times Square. I was like, oh, okay. Man, they got all the nice little gear out here, little sweaters and everything. I said, okay, let me grab me an NYPD hoodie, man, you know? You so, picked uh, the NYPD hoodie out of all the hoodies you could. You couldn't yeah. have picked the fire department. They're so controversial. They so controversial. Uh, yeah, New York Liberty, I would have taken them. I knew, I knew Jason was going to get, I knew Jason was going to lose his, his temper once he saw this sweatshirt. I was like, oh, no. Jason probably Jason probably gonna blow up when he see this. Oh Lord! And he didn't me. comment first. I commented first. <laughs> I, I thought my eyes were deceiving me. <laughs> I because you know he got the little string running down the middle of the deal. So I'm like, oh, he got NYP Park District or something. Nah, man, this is this is all NYPD, man. Oh, oh Lord! NYPD. Well, we gonna hurry up and get you on and off today, man. What you working on, man? What you working look, on? Look, I'm seeing the, I'm seeing a private chat. There's like 15 minutes left. Hurry up! <laughs> you know, and you ain't got 15. So, so what you working on, man? Give me your stories you working on this week. Oh uh, man, you know I got the Bears Packers on Sunday, so that should be interesting Sunday night. And uh, thank God Green Bay lost yesterday so we got a chance to trim that uh nfc north division lead down to one if we can pull off a sunday night football victory hopefully uh then uh my second story will be on illini basketball in their upcoming season and i'll be focusing on uh, a little bit on adam miller and what he brings to the team uh, along with a already potent star lineup and uh returning uh, actually the big 10 rookie of the year uh, and then in addition to that, uh, last but not least, it'll be on CPS Sports and their current uh, status uh, in winter sports. So it'll be those three stories. 
Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Definitely uh, a lot of changes here with the women's sports schedule. The IHSA tried to play, and Governor Pritzker rejected that <laughs> big time. Uh, so there will be no women's sports anytime soon as the COVID pandemic continues to kind of go through us. Uh, Bears Packers is always a big week. We are not discussing Bears this week because they were on a bye week, thank God. So we don't have to discuss them. <laughs> so right. we will not be discussing them on the show. So, um, yeah, Joe, thank you for joining us in your <laughs> NYPD shirt. You know what, Jay? I got to ask my man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, oh, thank you man. Jason, Jason, Jason is very short tempered, man. You got to work on that temper, brother. Yeah, like I got to ask my man, Joe, some cover questions. I can't yeah. let him off so easy. Illinois basketball. Yeah. What's your thoughts on the what's your thoughts on the basketball team this year? What oh, you think? Because it's six teams rated in the top 25 in a league. So what's your thoughts? Man, they're poised to make a run in, in, in the Mar in March Madness. I got them as one of the top 10 teams in, in the NCAA. Mm -hmm. Uh they have a starting lineup that's a force to be reckoned with with anyone. Especially they got skilled at center. Uh, you know, they got Io there from Morgan Park. They got Adam Miller coming from Morgan Park. So man, I mean they're deep from what schools did Park. you just say? What high schools did you just say? From what high schools? Morgan Park. It's, Morgan it's, Park. Okay. It's the brothers, it's the brothers old stumping ground. You know, so uh, you know, it, it, it's looking pretty good out there thanks to your brother. You know, he he, he put him in a, a, a perfect situation to succeed. And um uh, I always love the Fighting Illini. I've always been loyal to one team in college basketball, and that's the Illinois Fighting Illini. Ever since, you know, uh, you know Kenny Battle and, and Kendall Gill and Stephen Bardo and all those guys, and even before that, you know, I was still loyal to the Fighting Illini. So now, how are you gonna say that tonight of all nights when we got the coach from Northwestern coming on the show in thirty minutes? Well, you mentioned that. I didn't say that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he always tried to make me look bad, man. Go you see, Go I'm on. in the business of making you look good. Jeff. I know. You got to make me look good. We on the same team, man. You look I, like a jealous teammate. You know what yeah, I mean? you know, Mike, he, what's your thoughts on Patrick Williams, the Bulls' number four pick? Oh, I love him. Shoot me straight. Because cousin over there, he was giving me a hard time. You said, when I hear high character and this, I think he can't play. Yeah, Jason is, is Jason is a skeptic, man. He, he <laughs> don't trust nobody. He he can't know it. So here's the deal, man. Patrick Williams, if you if you get a chance, go to his YouTube video of him playing against the pros. And when I'm talking about, and I know it's just pickup because you can't really evaluate stuff and pick up. And when I'm talking about consistent on every possession, I mean this brother was hitting threes, dunking on guys. He was bullying guys, man. I mean, to a point where Spencer Dinwiddie was like, he has no ceiling. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. this guy mm -hmm. a so I think we're going off because we wanted a guy. I wanted Obi Toppin originally. But unlike the last two weeks before the draft, Patrick Williams' name started creeping up. And I was like, well, who is this guy? And come to find out, man, you know, he was only a freshman, 19 years old. Second in scoring on the team and on a deep team, you know, like if you put him in the starting lineup, man, that guy could have averaged like 14, 15 a game, probably like seven or eight rebounds. So you give you bring him to the NBA where there's no defense and he plays both ends of the floor, which we don't have on our team. We don't have players that do that. Um, and he's not a one dimensional guy. He can knock down mid range shots. He can bang with the best of them. And, and most of them, his player comp, which I wrote a story on him this week. I did a feature story on him. It's like Kawhi Leonard. So, you know, the sky's the limit. I'm not saying he's going to be Kawhi Leonard. I'm just saying that he he's the future of this team if, if, if he does the work. Gotcha. Well, once again, that's Joseph Phillips from the Chicago Crusader newspaper. Thanks for joining us again, Joseph. And All we right. will check you out. Make sure you have a good holiday weekend. All right. Happy Thanksgiving. And stop the hate, Jason. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Peace out, man. <laughs> That's Joseph Phillips from Chicago say to everybody. We got some more topics we got to get to here before we bring on our first guest, man. We got a lot of stuff going on here. Let's talk okay. about our White Sox. The White Sox kind of made some news today. I don't know if you heard about this. I know you're a busy man working. Man. But they were scheduled to play in Iowa this past season in the uh, Field of Dreams game. But due to uh, COVID, the game got 
postponed. Well, today they announced that the game is on. The game is on. Um, it will be, we have that somewhere by, I put it in there earlier. Uh, the, I think the game is August 21st um, in Iowa. They will be playing the Yankees again in the Field of Dreams game. So um, there we go. There it is. Um, Field of Dreams game. They got Tim Anderson and uh, Aaron Judge there promoting. It's actually August the 12th. Our White Sox will be in Iowa. So, you know, maybe we can talk to Maya and she can get us some tickets. She got <laughs> hookups in Iowa. So uh, the Field of Dreams game in Iowa. White Sox and Yankees. What you think about that, cuz? I'm looking forward to that. You know, I think the Sox, we ended the year not like we wanted to. But with that being said, I think we prime next year because once you get used – to winning and you get used to playing in the playoffs, I think that's going to help us. And, you know, I'm a huge Yankee fan. That man, Aaron Judge, that's a bad boy right there. So I'm looking forward to that. And Maya going to get us some tickets. I have confidence. I have I am confident little sister going to get us some tickets. Well, she's going to have to be really good because they, like, really built uh -oh. Jason, don't you already have tickets to the game? Uh, not to that. Not, not. But, there's no way, but, there's no, but there's no way they can say if you had tickets to the original game that got postponed because of COVID, that they wouldn't honor what you had. That wouldn't make any sense. No, I didn't have tickets to that game. Oh, I thought you had tickets to the field. No, the I one. didn't. I didn't oh, have tickets to that oh, game. Man. I wish I did. Because what happened, you know, that's a stadium that they're building. Mm -hmm. And it's like literally supposed to be like a small town environment. So I think it's only like 200 tickets they're going to sell. Well, anyway. it's like the field of dreams. So my, yeah. my, my, I don't trust Jason because he was on y'all show last week and he tried to sneak it in and I didn't know. I don't trust him. He probably has tickets. I don't have tickets. You <laughs> got tickets. You have tickets. I know my. Thanks. Thanks, my, for telling me about that. I know. Right. I, think, I think he got tickets too. <laughs> I, I know he does. I know he has tickets, my. <laughs> I'm not laughing. If I don't go find you another, but you know what, my call Corey Irvin, tell him I'm leaving the show. We in a dispute over tickets. I don't have tickets. I don't know why you, you all think tickets. I'm. I don't know why y'all think I'm stub or something. I'm but I do not have tickets. I'm but I will. Dwight. I will try to get some tickets. If I can get us some tickets, then I. Well, I guess I got to get two now because my is going to come too. So. Uh, all right, I'll try to get us three tickets. Not telling the truth. Not telling the truth. I, I promise. I swear. Not I'm gonna try to get us tickets. So, so that game is back on, and it's August the 12th. Then we got some other news. We got some religious news uh, that we got to bring on the show. I probably, I probably should let you announce this because I make it short my life in this spot. He was mentioning. I let thing. you. I let you talk about the NBA players going to speak to the Pope. Yeah. Have, they, have they said who's who's going, Cub? Well, one of the people's is our good friend Sterling Brown from Chicago. Um, Sterling is one of the players who's been selected to go, but five NBA players have been selected to meet with Pope Francis. It's Francis, right? Mm -hmm. I almost said John Paul. Uh, Pope Francis <laughs> at the Vatican in Italy. They are flying over to Italy, and they're going to meet with the, 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 the Pope to uh, discuss their uh, social justice initiatives. As we know, that's been a big thing uh, with the NBA players, and they're going to go over there. Apparently, the, the Pope saw what they were doing. Uh-oh, what did I screw up? <laughs> no, no, no. What the hell are they going to talk to the Pope for? <laughs> okay, I'm ca I, I can Let say this. here, Maya, come on. I'm a non Catholic. I'm a non-practicing Catholic. I mean, I'm a Roman <laughs> Catholic. When I was a kid, I said Mass in Latin. That's how Catholic I was. Right. I'm trying to figure out what exactly I expect for him to do because the Catholic Church at no point of time have taken a stance on social justice, really. My God, they can't even get the whole child abuse stuff right. So what exactly do you think the pontiff is going to do? I mean, what? You want to throw some cash at it? That's about all they can do. <laughs> Let's throw some cash at it. I mean, is that what it is? Are we talking dollars? Sometimes you need dollars, cash dollars for redemption? Is that what it is? Some dollars for redemption? Is that what it is? But is it good to get the word out, Maya? About what? I mean, what is, I mean, I'm sorry, do you think all of a sudden the Pope is going to say something and it's going to affect people? Somebody made the best post, and I'm going to leave, it says, for good putting Christ back in Christmas, put Christ back in Christians. How about that? That's why I fool with you. That's a great quote, Maya. That's, That's a why great I quote, fool. Maya. I ain't going to lie. That's I mean, wrong I right there. I mean, I, I am the heathen on this show, so you know That's I don't. Wrong I, right there. I'm glad I didn't say it, but okay, Maya said it. So. If you look at it, Jay, it's probably a good gesture mm -hmm. from the NBA by the NBA to get their players to go out and talk to them. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you never know what can get done, but mm-hmm. at least it keeps the issue out on the forefront, right? This With is true. that being said, you know, Maya is more into it. She probably knows a little bit more than what, mm-hmm. what I'm saying about the issue right now. But anytime you could talk about it, hopefully they could get something done. I don't mm-hmm. know, but at least they're going out there to talk about it. And we'll see what happens after that. We will. We will. Uh, other news. The NBA are in free agency period, or what I now call who got next period, because <laughs> the general managers ain't doing nothing. It's the players deciding what they're going to do. So the players are basically picking their own teammates at this point. We need to stop calling it free agency and just who you got next. So uh, – Lots of stuff going on, man. A lot of people moving around. A lot of people making a whole lot of money. Tim Hardaway Jr., I saw, he he got like a two-year extension or something for $19 million. And, I mean, has there been anything that has shocked you so far in this free agency period? Gordon Haywood, who's coming <laughs> off multiple injuries, four years, $120 million. I'm, That's a lot of cash. It ain't tricking if you got it. <laughs> He's coming off multiple injuries too. He hurt his leg, correct? Then hurt his right. ankle. I mean, I was shocked at the number. You know, Justin Tatum, five years, one hundred and ninety-five million. Yeah. Him and Donovan Mitchell. That's like more than what the CPS teachers make. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> it's a lot of cash being thrown out there. Fred Van Fleet, who I was interested to see how much Fred was going to get. I think mm-hmm. he's got like four years, 82 million or 80 something million. But mm-hmm. it's a lot of money being put out there these days. Like I was talking to Corey and Mac, and Corey told me, Big Mac is on Little Mac to shoot his jump shot. I said, He need to for the type <laughs> cash they're throwing out there these days. <laughs> he need to at his size. But free agency, I think the Lakers loaded up again, Jay. I mean, yeah, the Lakers made work. some uh, making some big moves, you know, and everybody said, you know, it's it's weird, but it seems like they've, they've actually gotten better because they're going to have a better team for the upcoming season than this past year's team where they won a championship. Yeah, you lose Rondo, you get Schroeder. You lose big, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Dwight Howard. You get mm-hmm. Montrez and Rail. Mm-hmm. You keep the Moors, brother. You get Mark Gasol, who's aging, but he really knows how to play the game. He's a good passer. So mm-hmm. now you get younger. You pick up some pieces. You know, LeBron might not have to play that many games starting out because they just finished the season about a week ago, it seems like. So right. now you have people who can score, and Wesley Matthews is on the team. Gotcha. So it seems like, to me, they got better. They got deeper, I'll tell you that. Yeah, should be fun. should be fun. And then our last topic – uh, big news for me. Uh, once again, I'm very proud of what the uh, NFL is actually doing tonight. Hey, in tonight's great. game, for the first time in history, great. all of the NFL officials will be African American. And not only that, but uh, of that crew, three of those um, officials went to historically black colleges and universities as well, including the referee tonight, Jerome Boger. Jerome Boger, who was the quarterback at Morehouse College in Atlanta. Uh, and then he went into officiating, and there was another uh, member of the crew who went to Grambling State. So, you know, I'm just very proud of what the NFL is doing. I know this is part of the initiatives that some of their social justice initiatives that the NFL is doing, and I know Jay-Z has uh, had a lot to do with that stuff. So history being to- made tonight on Monday Night Football, you're going to have an all-African-American crew, and I know that's something, you know, we want to talk about uh, some of this stuff with Mark as well in terms of what the NBA referees are doing as well. So, Um, So we got a loaded show coming up for you. Uh, We're going to take our first break. And coming up, our first guest for tonight, NBA referee Mark Davis. Stay tuned. See me. See me. See me. See my dark skin and my kinky hair. See me. Don't see past me. Don't see through me. See me. See my tan skin and my curly hair. See me. Don't see past me. Don't see through me. See me. See me. 
see my face wet with tears from years of oppression. See my hands weathered and worn from decades of pulling myself up through your society. See my feet split from centuries of walking your delicate line. See me. See me. See me. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. Father Tony Allen, listen up. It's time to be first team all defense against the coronavirus. Here's a few tips. You gotta lay low, stay at home as much as possible, and please stay away from the crowds and gatherings. The more you social distance from others, better for all. Even if you don't feel sick, stop the spread and play lockdown defense. Enjoy all the good Memphis restaurant food you want, but please make it takeout or delivery. If you feel sick, do not go to work or the store. And yes, I know you hear this a lot, but wash your hands. We're going to get through this, but we've got to work together like a team to make it happen. For more information on the coronavirus, go www.cdc.gov. And remember, first team all defense. Welcome back, everybody, to What's Up Cuz. That's Chicago's own Tony Allen. The he did a nice little, the grinder. You know, he did a nice, he had a nice little career, man. Nice little NBA. Did he, did he sign with anybody? Is he officially retired at this you know, point? No, T.A. is done right now. At okay. this point, I think he was helping Memphis doing community service, or he maybe was in the back of the bench right now. I'm not sure, but he had a heck of an NBA career. Yeah, so, yeah. Did, he, oh, did, did he, man? He was a grinder, man. West Side grinder. kid. Man, he played, uh, I got to see him play with Will Bynum on them crane teams back in the day, man. He played so hard, Jay. I mean, his work ethic. Oh man, the grind that fit him. First team all <laughs> defense, TA. I tell you that. <laughs> without a doubt, without a doubt. So, um, so we're gonna get ready to bring on our first guest. This is a guy who uh he was a guy who I really wanted on the show in the beginning. Um, you know, we had a list of guests when we first started this show, and we had certain people we say are really key people, um, uh, because we want to give a a lot of diversity in the type of guests we bring on the show. And with me being a sports official myself, you know, this is a, a really important topic to me. But I also think, you know, just the education of the fans. And I think what the NBA referees have done in the last, you know, few years under this guy's leadership and and uh, in trying to educate fans and really trying to be transparent of what we actually do as officials, I think it deserves a lot of praise. And I think it needs to be talked about a lot, but it was really hard to get them because of COVID happening and the season didn't end when we thought the season was going to end and then it started back up again. And then he had to go down there and do some stuff. But uh, we we're very pleased to have one of our own from the South side of Chicago. He's a graduate of uh, St. Ignatius uh, is where he went to high school. And then he went to the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. So he's a Navy man and he is one of the premier referees in the world. And we are pleased to have him joining us, NBA referee Mark Davis. Welcome to What's Up, Cuz. Mark, how you doing, brother? Uh-oh. You're muted there, Mark. Uh-oh. We got no sound from Mark. And now we got no Mark. <laughs> Can you hear us, Mark? Okay, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. All right, no problem. We're going to give Mark a little bit of time there to try to work that situation out. You know we have the NBA, NBA iPod, <laughs> the, the air bugs or whatever you call those things. You know, Mark over there, big balling. <laughs> right. I'm sure he'll get them fixed, you know, all the stuff the NBA gives you. 
headphones, this, that, and other. But man, Mark is a great person. I'm so, so just real quick, what do, what do you what do you think about the Bulls? We wait, wait for Mark to get readjusted there. I mean, what do you think they they go do now with Patrick Williams? And they've been quiet in free agency. I know they did pick up a another guard uh, the other day. Yeah, they picked up. Uh, the, 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 you know, I read it. You know, Jay, I should I, I should know. Oh, Garrett Garrett Templeton. You mm-hmm. know, Garrett Templeton, six five six six. Been in the league for a couple couple of years. I mean, the jury is still out on the Bulls, right? Mm-hmm. I think it depends on how fast Larry Marketing can come along this year, and I say that all the time. I love Larry Marketing, excuse me, but he needs to pick it up a little bit. I don't know if he t- if it takes a coach to really believe in him. Or what? I don't know if he's too hard on himself because he can really play. Okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I think we might have Mark back. We'll give us another shot. I'm not going through that long introduction again. <laughs> Mark Davis, is he here? <laughs> Please don't. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yeah, Mark. there we go. Right. <laughs> Maya told me that you wear my uh, earbuds, but that doesn't seem to work. So I took them out, and there we go. You know, Mark. <laughs> I, I heard we- what you were saying, Brother Palmer, about me not being on the show, but I was – tied up but it wasn't to be tell you the actually the only reason i did it is because brooklyn was on me about it <laughs> <laughs> brooklyn was Whoa. on me about it that makes what is that that makes three generations i know multiple in that generation but that's the third <laughs> generation of irvings to give me the side eye and, uh, give me to do something i didn't want to do so uh I'm blessed to be on here. Thank you guys so much for having me on. You know what, Mark? Let me say this. I'm so proud of you. Just watching you come up through the ranks throughout the years. And, uh, you know, you a great person. And just, and just, man, I'm so proud of you. I remember one day when you was in Dallas. I think you were reffing in Dallas. And I was gone. And some kind of way, Brooklyn and Paula got in touch with you, got a hold of you. They was like, Daddy, we at the Dallas Maverick game. I said, I'm not there. Uncle Byron didn't get his tickets. That's like Mark Davis gave us some tickets. So, man, I appreciate you. Thanks for being on the show and what you've been doing in the NBA is great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we go a long way back. I was thinking, I was just driving um, to run an errand. And I was thinking about being on the show and kind of getting my mind ready for that. And I started thinking about Irving stories. And the first thing that comes to mind was probably on a Little League baseball field. I remember your dad saying, hey, Ryan, I'm telling you, this basketball, I'm telling you, it's something with this basketball. More scholarships in basketball than in baseball. I think that's when you were pitching big time, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, but – he was like, no, nah, this is something here. And over at Old Chatham, why? Way back, man. I don't even think, was Nick even born then? No, Nick wasn't born then. No. Even there. I had to look at Nick one time and say, man, I knew you for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, Mark, I, I, I looked up one day and I really didn't know. I looked up. I was thinking I was watching the Houston Rockets. I was like, that's Mark Davis out there. Right? <laughs> like, what made you get to – officiate um you know it's interesting i was thinking about that with the uh gentlemen that are working the nfl game tonight mm-hmm. and i was just thinking about how just like a perfect storm i came into it into a time where one if there's ever any doubt chicago is the preeminent place for um for basketball just the basketball dna here is so strong and if you go to you think about it from a couple of different perspectives one it's such a small world i was coaching and teaching at Hales Franciscan at the time, mm-hmm. before I started refereeing, I was coaching with a buddy of mine, coaching the freshman boys team. I was subbing for a woman who was on maternity leave. She came off maternity leave around Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a job. Athletic director at the time said, you ought to referee because the public schools play during the daytime. The first game I refereed, uh, Fred Mills, who's a longtime official and was one of the Little League dads from Southeast Little League, um, was actually, I refereed his game. He brought me a whistle at halftime. I had a whistle with a P in it. Mm-hmm. He brought me a, a real whistle at halftime. He <laughs> came to me and said, hey, Mark, you know, real whistle, real referees don't wear these whistles. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the coach of where I was doing. Afterwards, he paid me. I think mm-hmm. I got 30 bucks. I was there for 45 minutes. I was making under 300 teaching six classes a day and coaching at Hales. My job was over. I said, do you like it? I said, I love it. 
He said, come on, come by my house or meet me over at um, Re Old Resurrection uh, mm -hmm. Grammar School. I do the CYO tournament. I got connected with him there. Officiating is something that each one teach one. So mm -hmm. many people um, are involved in helping you. I kind of got in it real quickly. I dove into it fast. Uh, I immediately was connected with the Metropolitan Officials Association. That's when I see these seven gentlemen working tonight. MOA is the first African-American officiating yes. association yeah. in the country. It was started in mm -hmm. 62. There's mm -hmm. some teachers at Phillips, some athletic directors in the public school, Mr. Bonner, Gerald Butler, Jim Foreman, Larry Hawkins, mm -hmm. uh, and a basketball official, my first mentor, uh, Mr. Malcolm Hemphill. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, and who was one of the first African-Americans to officiate in the Big Ten. So you get in with a group like that at the time, Keith, um, Lionel Yates, uh, Ruben Norris, Mile Kaysan, I've known, I've known him mm -hmm. since I was eight years old. Uh -huh. uh, he was calling that garbage against me. <laughs> <laughs> if you reach, you go call <laughs> what? <laughs> we used to say, you're not coaching this, you're refereeing. He says, yes, I am. I'm doing the same thing at the time. Without a doubt. One thing to connect, you know, it just it, it went in, and then and the other thing about you look at Malcolm Gladwell, you look at ten thousand hours, mm -hmm. uh, Chicago. There's no better place. From the time I started officiating until I got hired in the NBA, I never went more than a day and a half without refereeing because we wow. always played basketball. Yeah. I got good sound instruction from some really phenomenal uh, mentors. The NBA began their three-person mechanic system. Here in Chicago, we've at the MLK Boys and Girl Club out west. Wow. Um, you know, one of my first four games I ever officiated, the first time I refereed with someone else, my first partner was Forrest Harris. Wow. Forrest Harris. It's the See, first yeah. person I ever refereed a game with. Yeah, I know, Mark. I know because, I mean, my path was similar. You know, even though yeah. I went the volleyball route, but, you know, MOA and Pam Young. Pam Young was my first instructor. You know, yeah. and, and just so many other people there. MOA really got a lot of us started in the business. And, you know, I know you've really kind of taken off with it and got to the NBA. And by the way, happy birthday today to Danny Crawford. Danny's from Chicago. Today's his birthday. Danny. So happy birthday to Danny. But uh, let me ask you this. You know, earlier this year, you had the privilege of being selected to referee at the All-Star Game, which yeah. was in Chicago. This yeah. is like literally a couple weeks before all hell broke loose with COVID. But you got to referee the All-Star game, and then after the shutdown, they came back up. You went down to the bubble. You worked in the bubble, and then you get to work the NBA Finals. So just from a personal standpoint, what was it like for you this year being able to come back home to Chicago to work the All-Star game, which hadn't been here since 88, and also be able to work the NBA Finals all in one season, Mark? Right. Um, yeah, this, this season was a whirlwind. Um, it seemed like it went forever because it, it did. It, 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 it was more than a year, the longest season in history of the NBA. Working the All-Star game in Chicago, I, I understand what Lance was just saying about how we're so proud of each other. Probably one of the things I was most proud of is seeing Rashid, seeing Common, you know, mm -hmm. seeing him up there, knowing his connection to Chicago basketball, knowing his connection to the city, um, with President Obama being there. Uh, all the people that were there to enjoy our city. And then the game and the way the game was structured, um, it was phenomenal. You know, mm -hmm. they, they at times can have a sense of being a highlight reel and more of an exhibition. But the minute that they we got to that fourth quarter, <laughs> format, it was on, like for real. And I think that that was, I, th I credit um, Adam Silver, our commissioner, he is open to any idea. If you mm -hmm. can it, if you can show it through any data points that it's a good sound idea mm -hmm. and you're willing to go up against the test of is it going to work and you really do that and go through it, then he's not tied to any one thing. He's just tied to the progress of our game. And so shout out to him and uh, listening to, uh, to the Players Association led by Chris Paul and Michelle Roberts with that suggestion. It was a phenomenal suggestion. I think it was the most entertaining all-Star game. I watched it again afterwards. I thought that fourth mm -hmm. quarter was as entertaining as it ever. was. It was. And Mark, I was watching and in the fourth quarter, I was like, man, Mark and them got a really rough now. Like, no, they serious. <laughs> you no, know, when I knew it was for real, just to show one of my neighbors, Sister Mary Carroll, uh, the former Sister Mary Carroll, who's now the um, 
Glock 36 and the After School Matters program. They were one of the sponsor kids. And I see her a lot, just walking her little dog, me walking my dog. And her team, I think she, I can't remember what team, because this is how little I care about the score, uh -huh. which team won, if it was LeBron's team or Giannis's team. But she must have been on the other team. And I see her all the time on my corner. She gave me a side eye. <laughs> <laughs> He gave me a side eye, and I said, uh-oh. So, no, it was it was phenomenal. And I hope when we do are able to come back and have another All-Star game that it'll be in that same format because that was entertaining. And it really showcased it our athletes. You guys know our, our mm -hmm. athletes are probably the, the finest athletes in the world. And, and people think because they make it look so easy, they have no idea how hard it is to do what they do. They have right. no So between that and the finals, and the fact that, as I said, um, what we were able to do through the bubble, 96 days of just being away from our families and working, mm -hmm. that was something. That was really something. But in any, in any case, you're doing something like that. And just like we'll do this year, we'll have to make some, some changes. And there'll be some adjustments that we have to do to stay safe. And so mm -hmm. you have to make a decision. Are you going to embrace it or are you going to endure it? If you're going to endure it and just check off days and struggle through it, then that becomes difficult. You decide to embrace it and realize why you're there doing it, it's not that difficult. And I really I, I applaud our players and all the staff at NBA and what they're able to put together uh, because they started off balling in that right off the bat too. Mm -hmm. Man, Mark, because I remember you and I were doing the 60-40 and you waved at me. You said, I'm gone for about three, four months. <laughs> yes. And I, let, I said, three, four months. Yeah. How was life in the bubble for you, Mark? Uh, I'll say this, Davis men have had to endure way much more. <laughs> uh, it was challenging being separated uh -huh. from the family. It was challenging. And, you know, we weren't allowed to be in each other's rooms. Okay. Uh, we weren't allowed to, you know, we got tested every day, obviously. But it really comes down to the key. I just saw the public service announcement that Tony T.A. did. And it comes down to washing your hands, staying socially distanced from one another. Um, and... and, and 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 staying six feet apart from each other. That's really the and wearing a mask and wearing a mask, mm -hmm. wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. And so we did those things every day, and people were responsible and caring about. See, wearing a mask is not about you. Like I can man up. I don't need. Yeah. I, wearing a mask is what you give to other people. It's mm -hmm. that you don't. No one else gets it. It's your responsibility to your community to wear a mask. We're not worrying about. You know, people can dismiss their own selves, but they should worry about their selves, their families, people who have comorbidities. That's the purpose of wearing a mask. So we did those three things, mm -hmm. and people committed to it, and uh, it went off well. It was very difficult being away from your family, missing taking your kids away to college for the first time, missing 16-year-old, you know, mm -hmm. getting your one son, getting a driver's license. Just being away from your family every day, it was, it was difficult. It really was. But mm -hmm. we did have each other, and that was one of the benefits of it. So we, we made it through. So, Mark, let me ask you this, just as a referee itself, I think what you guys do in the NBA Referees Association is, is very progressive with some of the stuff that you've done. And one of the things that you've done, starting, I think you all did it first in 2018, you kind of have, have gone on with it, is you have referee watch parties on Twitter. Yeah. And I'm going to read what it actually says on you guys' account. Okay. It says, encouraging communication, dialogue, and transparency with NBA fans while offering expertise from our elite group. Let's talk. That's that's basically on the 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 account, the Twitter account. And my thing is, you know, I'm all about trying to help educate fans too, because a lot of my friends they'll ask a question: Why did the ref call this? Why didn't they call that? You all are really doing something extraordinary because mm -hmm. most of the time people just want the referees to sit in the background, and that's kind of what we've done. Okay, if we're not noticed, that means we did a good game. True. You all are opening things up where you're actually inviting questions in from the public, which could be treacherous, but, but you yeah. all are actually doing that. Talk a little bit about that initiative and why you all decided to do that. Well, I, I think it comes down to transparency. There, there's, there's nothing to hide. Now, a well-officiated game is one in which – no one recognizes the referees, mm -hmm. but then they also look at the other side. You know, we, there's also the thought that one team wins in spite of you and the other loses because of you. And I just think if we, the more we can educate fans on what we're doing. So the, the principle behind it was if we have a difficult decision or a difficult call, we want to explain why it was made, why it was correct, why it was incorrect. If you're a 
Boston fan and it happens against your team, it might be difficult to understand that night because you're emotionally charged mm -hmm. with, that, with that team. But if you see that same play judged the same way two weeks ago and now it's Utah, you might go, hmm, they did say that last week. This is just what they do. And I think that one of the fundamental tenets of officiating is fairness and equity that similar plays be judged similarly. And that's why we have the guidelines. That's why we constantly are in communication with the teams, our, our referee oper operations department. They don't send us any memos or us any plays that they don't share with the other team, with the teams as well. So everybody's on the same page. So the more we do that and we, the more we can educate our fans, the more they'll understand that we're just, we have either been successful in doing what we set out to do or unsuccessful. And we're willing to stand behind either one of those because a mistake is something that we're going to correct and get better the next time. I don't think they people understand just how much we study it, how much we want to get it right. Mm -hmm. how mistakes we make that you might not even recognize. <laughs> <laughs> we're on it from that way. And I think people don't, don't know that. And the more you open that veil up and you allow people to ask questions, you realize you're not hiding. And sometimes the answer is, I should have stepped left. I should have read this defender pushing me left. I should have pushed, gone into that defender. I should have gone into that pressure. I'd have stepped down. I'd have seen that point of contact. We missed that call because of fundamental error that we made, as opposed to I missed that call because I don't like you or I want this team to win. NBA referees could care less what team wins. And I think the more we put that out there, the more we show what we're doing, the more we're transparent in what we're doing, the more people understand and then the, the more people can really enjoy our game and really get back to what they're supposed to be doing, which is not worrying about the officiating, but watching our phenomenal athletes do the phenomenal things that they do every night. You know what, Mark? I'm glad you said that. From a coach's point of view, all we want is the game to be ref fair, right? That's it. That's it. <laughs> if you missed the call, okay, you missed the call. But explain to us why you made the call. That's it. And I think officiate, everybody thinks that they can do it but you can't do it like you guys can do it. So I think what you just said, that was excellent because you educating us. And one thing about the NBA that I love is that you guys have women reffing the games also. Talk to me about how important it was to have some diversity in the NBA and women officiating games also. Well, I mean, how can you claim to be, to have the best 70 anythings in the world if you discount 50% of the population on this earth? Mm -hmm. How can you say that? That's the same argument that we extrapolate before when we when we opened up diversity to people of color, when we opened up diversity to people in school where people have learning differences. You can't claim to be the best in the world. We can't claim to be the best 70 if we don't include the entire population of the world. And so I think that women, I don't see anything physically that I do that I could that I don't think my daughter could do in terms of the show in terms of watching the game and what we do in terms of eye coordination. Now, what has happened historically is that there is a difference in the level of basketball that you've been trained at. And so it's been very difficult from the past for any official who primarily refereed the woman's game to come in the NBA, whether they be man or woman. Mm -hmm. But there's so many young women who are involved in our training program that work in the G League, that work men's basketball, at, that work boys' basketball in high school, to get up to those speed reps to referee that, I think that number is only going to increase. Because once given the opportunity, I, I, I don't see there being much difference physically between anything a woman can do and anything a man can do as it pertains to refereeing. It's all, it's all sight. It's all understanding angles. It's all repetition. And it's all recall. And the more reps these young women get, you find them to be just as competitive as the young men in our program, if not more, because in many, t in many places, they have something to add. There's just a certain something they add to our game that doesn't change the competitiveness of it. It just changes the impact on a decision and what we do and what we, and what we stand for in our communities. And I, I mean, I just, I think it's great. And I think they're going to be more. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the young sisters that I work with now and the ones coming up, I mean, they, they can referee. They really can. And they're tough, too, because you got to be. And because uh, no one, you know, they're never going to clap for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Never, ever, ever. They're going to clap for you. So it takes, we make a joke and we say, you know, 
what is it about it? How do you know an NBA referee? Well, you know, when they go get an MRI, there's this little vacuous space right below their heart. And that's where normal human beings' feelings go, except mm-hmm. we'll hold there for referee because we don't have feelings. Right. <laughs> so, so Mar, talk to me about being a crew chief. What's the difference in a crew chief, a regular ref, an official? Because yeah. you hear them lead it to, and the crew chief tonight is Mark yeah. Davis. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what's the difference? Yeah. Well, the difference is we're responsible for primarily the majority of our responsibilities deal with pregame and postgame, administrative okay. duties, organizing the crew in terms of our travel, in terms of where we go, making sure that our prep for that day um, in preparation for the game, be it our, our teaching, our rules, um, what we our rules review, our fundamental review, our videotape review, that you kind of organize and coordinate that. But at the end of the day, the crew chief is primarily responsible for any difficult decisions that may come up that need to be addressed during the game, any administrative uh-huh. things, the lights go out. The 24-second clock doesn't work. Instant replay review. Ultimately, we, we make the decision on some of those plays after taking input from, um, from our partners, both in the studio and out. And so, but at the end of the day, you're required to make good, sound decisions because mm-hmm. you're supposed to be the best referee and you make a whole lot of mistakes. What does that do to the credibility of the entire crew? Right. So fundamentally, I'm responsible for referees and defenders, staying in my primary calling, obvious plays, elite officials, elite players, they just do the basics better than everybody else. And I can't see through people. I can't see around corners. I just, <laughs> and I, I can't do that. I just do the basics yeah. better. You know what I mean? It's just, I'll be like, trying to tell them, Mark. <laughs> I'll be trying to tell them. Yeah. You know, elite just, they just do the basics better. Just your mm-hmm. fundamentals better. Our better players are more fundamentally sound. It's just, mm-hmm. just it, our coaches are just better, more fundamentally sound. Our better coaches at all levels, teachers, yeah. more fundamentally sound. That's just what we try to constantly work on. Right. A couple more minutes left with Mark Davis here from the NBA. I got a couple of quick questions uh, sure. as they relate to refereeing. Um, you're getting ready to prepare for the season to start again. You got a real quick turnaround. Physically, uh, I know the amount of injuries you all deal with. I don't talk about it a lot. I know there are a lot of knee injuries. I know people have had to retire because of knee injuries. It's a pounding and the amount of travel that you all do as well. Um, how are you preparing for this season as opposed to seasons in the past? Well, the turnaround is pretty quick. So a lot of it is is emotionally getting yourself around and just kind of turn the corner and close that book and begin this book for this year. I'm doing a lot of soft tissue movements and stretching Mm -hmm. um, and just get, I mean, look, I'm 52 years old. So what I did as 22 and 32 to prepare is different. I'm not lifting weights anymore. I don't do anything that doesn't really involve just my body weight. I'm doing more running uh, because we have to run more. And I think the 60, 40 challenge was huge as Lance talked about it. It was just something every day to do uh, that kept us moving. Um, and so I'm doing a lot of soft tissue stuff, a lot of stretching, a lot of movement, a lot of mobility to be able to move through an entire range of motion. I'm working on being able to get my body in different positions with different angles. Of, I'm particularly, since you asked, I'm mm-hmm. particularly working on ankle mobility this off season because that's real important in mm-hmm. terms of it being the bottom of the chain, the closest thing to the floor and how that reverberates to your whole body. So I'm, I'm really working on that. And uh, those are the things I'm, I'm doing. And, but at the end of the day, it's a uh, primary principle workout is eight sets of stop eating so much crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, hear you. I hear you. And that's hard to do in Chicago. because We got a lot of good stuff that ain't looking for you. <laughs> called Harold's dead last week. <laughs> I have my last slice of pizza this week. And just rock it on that from henceforth. Yeah. And let me ask you this too before we let you go. Uh, the NBA referees, you all did a lot with the social justice initiatives, mm-hmm. lockstep with the players. I can't let you get out of here without talking about that and why that was so important for you all as an association to do that, to be locked up with the players and some of the efforts that you all did. Well, for one, if you look at our players and our players are, are younger than most referees, they are phenomenal young men. They are businessmen. They are brands unto themselves. They have been taking care of themselves and their families through their very young developmental ages. Um, but what, what we wanted to share with them, but and then you look at our group, we span the entire group demographic. Mm-hmm. We go from 30 to 65. 
We have people of all persuasions, all gender identities, um, races, ethnicities, uh, political parties. And so we really wanted to spend some time together talking about what we could agree on. And so we just, we had a couple basic rules was one, whenever you have a conversation, we had a lot of group discussions, seek to understand the other person's point of view, not to be understood. So that was the number one rule. Two, there was no, there was no question. There's no question <laughs> was, um, that should not be asked. Mm -hmm. Questions asked. And three, we wanted to be a safe space for people to talk and ask any questions that they wanted. To. And so one of the things that we wanted to discuss with the players there was that just because you are physically in a bubble doesn't mean you need to mentally be in a bubble. That we are physically in this bubble, but we can, we can impact our communities just the same. Our communities might not need another set of boots next to them as they silently and peacefully protest for change in our communities, but they do need people to advocate and to speak about that. So there's no need for us to come out of this bubble when people will come in here and you can actually bring 79th and Cottage Grove to the bubble because when they put a microphone in front of your face, you can talk about you can talk about my block, my hood, my city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can talk about the differences. And so another thing we decided as referees was we weren't going to talk about right versus left, Republican mm -hmm. versus Democrat. We're going to talk about right versus wrong. And then you look at our, the principles and the mission statement of the NBA and the principles and the mission statement of the NBRA, the National Basketball Referee Association, mm -hmm. they're aligned. They're really very simple. And if whenever things get really difficult, if you just go back to your mission statement, and our mission statement includes inclusivity, social justice, it's not really that big of a stretch. So we found things that we could all agree on, that people should be treated equally, that people should be treated fairly, that we sh everybody should have a safe space regardless of color. Um, and though when we found those things that we could agree on, then we could agree to promote and discuss those things that we need to discuss and then get off of the things that we didn't agree to. And then we found out how much we did agree with because we actually got a chance to talk to them. We almost got to populate each other's areas with other thoughts and other ideas. We had an official who grew up in the South, a young white gentleman, and we went, when we decided to kneel as a group, he had some real issues with it. And he, but once we discussed it and we had a conversation, he understood Black Lives Matter. He understood that because initially he was saying all lives matter. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. had the person that said, well, wait a minute. That can't be true if black lives don't matter. Right. So no one's just we're not separating anybody's life from another. But all lives can't matter if black lives don't matter because it's not all. Yeah. And once he understood that he was there and he spoke to his grandmother, who was from rural Tennessee. And she understood that. Reverend Sharpton speaking to his grandmother in rural Tennessee is different than her baby coming to understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we really had a chance to populate that. And we just wanted to let the players know that we support you. <clears throat> we support you in your efforts. But let us let us offer just a little bit of perspective as being gentlemen that are just a little bit older than you, a little bit of perspective on where you can use your voice, how you can use your resources to affect a more positive change while we're all here. So that's that's where we are with that. And it's in, li it's in line with our, our company's values and its mission statement. So it's not that big of a stretch. Gotcha. I, I, I personally, I have to say this, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so proud of the seven black men, eight black men who are working that game tonight. Oh, mm -hmm. That's a shame that <laughs> that we are all the way here and that has just, just happened. And right. I was just thinking about that. But we, right. we got there, we're there now and we keep it moving and that's just the way it goes. But you know, hopefully one day we'll see, you know, three Asian ladies and mm -hmm. black women and two white men and a, and a black man doing it. We won't, and it won't even be an issue. It'll just be those sorry refs. That's <laughs> I, I hear you, Mark. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I, and, and, you know, and I do applaud you know, what they're doing tonight. Also, yeah. Sarah Thomas is an NFL uh, official as well. She's the first female. Uh, we got to get baseball to get with the program and we got to get hockey. Um, I do talk to Kim from the NHL office and um, I think pretty sure we're going to have our first African-American NHL official, but uh, we got to get major league baseball to get with the program here a little bit faster. But Mark, Hey, thank you so much, man. We really wanted to have you. We wanted to have you a long time and uh, just good luck to you, brother. And we're very proud of you. Thank you so much. God bless. Appreciate it. Right. Thank you. We'll be, right back. we'll be right back with Chris Collins, the head coach of Northwestern. We're going to talk some wildcat big 10 basketball. Coming up right after this on What's Up Cuz.
Compassion, noun, sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. We're all born with it, it's in us. Don't believe me? When you hear a baby cry, something pulls at you. You want to ease that pain. You want to soothe that hurt. No one had to teach you that. It's called compassion and it's in you. However, at some point you turned it off when it came to me. 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 The cries of my soul have gone unheard, but today, you will hear me. My heart has wailed a melody loud enough to shatter your ears and you ignored me, but this week, you will hear me. This body has beat the drums of anguish, only to be silenced, but this month, you will hear me. This year, this decade, this century, I will be heard. And you. And you will be the one to hear me. And when I am finally heard. Show compassion. Show compassion. Show compassion. Remember. It's in you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to What's Up Cuz. I'm your host, Jason Palmer, along with my cousin, the coach himself, Lance C. Irvin. Welcome back to What's Up Cuz. Sorry about that. I had the button mute and Uh <laughs> Man, that was fun talking to Mark Davis, man. That's your boy from Biddy League Basketball, huh? You know, basketball, baseball, anytime you could get that point of view on what he does for a living is great. Because like I mentioned, everyone thinks they can ref. Like everybody sits at home, that's a bad call. That's a, He stinks. <laughs> But you don't know what goes into refereeing, right? So just having them on to educate our fans, I think that was huge. I do too, man. And, you know, me being a referee, you know, I really appreciate hearing from someone like Mark. You know, he's a really good brother. And to see him get to the highest level in the officiating vocation, which is not easy to do, I just have mad respect for him. So appreciate that. But uh, let's get to our next guest, man, because the college basketball season is getting ready to tip off this week. And we've got the coach of Chicago's Big Ten team, this guy, you know, he's a native of our area. He played his high school ball at McGlibrook North, where he became a McDonald's All-American. He then went on to play at Duke University. He played professionally in Finland. And then he followed into the coaching ranks like his father, legendary Doug Collins. And now we got him on our show. You pulled it <laughs> off, Lance. I asked you. I challenged you. Could you get this guy on the show? You did it. And I'm so happy for you. But I'm even happy that we have the head coach of Northwestern, Chris Collins. Coach, how you doing? Welcome to What's Up, Cuz. What's up, guys? I can't believe you're making me follow Mark Davis, though. That, <laughs> I'm going to be dirty with that. You got to Mark Davis on. But, uh, no, man, Lance is my guy, and uh, he wanted me on the show. I was there right away. I said, when do you need me? Man, you did, Chris. I appreciate you being on. You know, you 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 mean a lot to the Urban family. You have been good to us. Your father's been good to us. The whole family. And uh, well, my cousin Jason, he was on me. Can you get Chris Collins on the show? Can you get Chris Collins on the show? I said, you know what? Let me call Chris. So I said, Chris, my cousin loves you. So I'm just going to sit back, Chris. Let him, let him enjoy himself, Chris. He had Corey Irvin on the show, who is my sister-in-law. Yeah. I was talking to him. He comes out with a Northwestern shirt on. He has a wore <laughs> Chicago State shirt. Didn't wear St. Xavier shirt. So my kind of you, guy. My kind of <laughs> guy. <laughs> so now you have Chris on. But you know what, Chris? I'm going to ask the first question, and I'm going to let him just run with it like he does. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you the question that I get asked so often these days. What is different coaching with COVID these days? I mean, yeah. it's been tough yeah. for me. How have you yeah. been dealing with coaching? Yeah, with COVID? it's been really difficult, Lance. You know, it's – uh you know, starting in the spring, you know, first of all, not being able to see our guys, everything shut down so quickly, you know, it was just like everyone was gone, everybody was home, and we really didn't see our guys until the end of the summer, you know, heading into the fall, 
and then just trying to be safe and have these these guys, you know, health and safety at the forefront. You know, it started off practicing in masks and social distancing and and you guys know, man, basketball is not a sport to be social distance and wearing <laughs> masks. And, you know, it's it's a it's a physical competitive and it's hard to talk trash when you have a mask. <laughs> That's been the hardest thing for me. Uh, but it's you know what we tried to just make do. I mean, it, and and you got to know every day and, you know, this Lance, like there's going to be curveballs about every day. You know, whether it's positive tests, whether it's new protocols, whether it's new health and safety guidelines, whether it's guys going into quarantine, like you literally have to come into every day and and know that, you know, you're probably going to get some news you might not like or mm -hmm. you're I mean, my schedule's changed about 15 to 20 times <laughs> in the last 20 days. You know that I saw you just picked up the game yesterday. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I saw I said I, I didn't think they were playing Illinois. Now they're playing Illinois. <laughs> so, I didn't think we were playing a beef. They told me when I walked in office. So it's been it's been crazy, but you know what? For the sake of these kids, like I hope that we can pull this off and they can play. I mean, all the things that they've done, the sacrificing, the you know, giving up. There is no college social life right now. They're mm -hmm. they're almost living in a mini bubble. They're coming to practice. They're trying to do what's right, and I just hope that that everything can can work out. The season starting this week, we can pull this thing off. Because the players deserve it, you know. Forget about the coaches. This is their time, mm -hmm. you know. They deserve that time to go out there and, and play college basketball. There's nothing like it. So Coach Chris, let me ask you. So, you know, a variety of things I want to talk to you about. But one of the things, um, as you bring up COVID, one of the things that helped a lot of us this summer deal with this COVID was the Last Dance on ESPN and watching it, and how many memories it brought back. You were a person who got to be right there in the thick of it, you know. Um, you got to see the development of the Bulls as your as your dad was the coach, and you got to be the ball boy. So you were around these guys. What did you think about the documentary itself, and how true do you think it really was for a person like yourself who was really right there with those guys every every day? How accurate was it? Yeah, well, the first thing you got it right, man. That that documentary saved all of us there for about whatever it was. <laughs> Man, we were dying for every Sunday night. I know I, like, I need to see something with some basketball. But um, the thing, you know, for me, I mean, obviously I was only around it during a three-year stretch. You know, the three years my dad was there. And 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 I thought they – the three years that they, they talked about when, you know, right after Michael had broken his foot, had the big game against Boston in the playoffs, the three years my dad was coaching, which kind of led to – you know, the Cleveland, the, the buzzer beater that shot on Elo mm -hmm. the Eastern Conference Finals. You know, I, I, I thought, at, at least for me, I mean, during that time, I was in middle school. So, I mean, you know, I, I was lucky being a ball boy to be kind of a fly on the wall and go to a lot of those practices. And, you know, I think the one thing people got a real sense of was just how competitive and how driven Michael was. Mm -hmm. You know, we all got to see it in the games, but – that's what always made the biggest impact on me as a kid was going to practice every day and like just seeing like he wanted to win every sprint. He wanted to win every shooting drill, every scrimmage. Like if you tried to sub him out, he wouldn't. He wanted to stay in there. And he was just so competitive, so driven. And it made a big impact on me as a kid, as someone who loved basketball, to see the most talented player in the world work that hard every day. I was like, man, if I want to be good, I better work hard. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it was really cool, too, just to be around like Scotty and Horace when they were rookies and young guys and kind of just watch that group get better. I mean, I just remember how fun it was in the city as they were making that run and and getting better. Forget about when they won the championships, just those mm -hmm. couple of years when when everybody sensed it was coming. You know, mm -hmm. for me, it was so fun. And obviously, uh, a lot of good stories uh, being being in the locker rooms and being at the games, and um, I learned a lot about the game. And 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 obviously, Michael was a big part of that. So let me ask you this, Chris, and talk a little bit about your program and what you're doing, kind of up there at Northwestern. Um, one of the things that people have said, and we talked about it on one of our earlier shows on Sean and Maya this morning, is. For some reason, there seems to be somewhat of a disconnection between some athletes on the south side and west side of Chicago and Northwestern in that it's so geographically close to the city, yet in so many minds, it's far away from the city. And I don't know if that's because everyone feels like 
they can't reach the academic standards to get an athletic scholarship to go to Northwestern, which we know is false. Um, what are you trying to do to get past that obstacle, to get more of the top athletes in Chicago to give Northwestern a chance in both football and basketball? Because you both are, are having really uh, successful programs. Your football team is off the chain this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, you know, I always growing up, even though I wasn't in the south side or west side, I was on the north side. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I've always, you know, Chicago was my home. And and I always felt, even for me coming out, like Northwestern wasn't a big option for me uh, coming out of high school. And and I kind of looked at it as an assistant coach. And I always, when I was at Duke and I, I just wondered why, you know, obviously they – the, the winning was part of it, you know, not having been an NCAA tournament caliber team, not producing a lot of pro, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was a great school. Anybody who's been on campus, I mean, it's right on Lake Michigan. Yes. Beautiful campus. You play in the Big Ten. It's high-level academics. And it was really important to me when I came back to, to, to try to recruit the area, you know. And, and really, if you look at our NCAA tournament team, um, that a couple from a couple years ago, we had Vic Law, who was a St. Rita product, who came from the South Side. We we had Scotty Lindsay from Fenwick. Um, we had Jordan Ash, you know, who grew up in Bolingbrook. Yeah. You know, Barrett Benson, who's from Willow. You know, we we had some local guys, you know, that were a big part of that, and we need to continue to do that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I've always said like I want to be an option. Now you're not going to get everybody, but I want the 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 better prospects and and the guys to be able to look at us and say, I got everything I need, and I can have my family at all the games, and I can stay home. Yes, you know, and and part of it is we have to continue to sustain ourselves as a winner. I think it helped when we did get there a couple of years ago. We won a game. We showed like it is doable. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we the last couple of years we took a little bit of a step back, and we got to reemerge. And you know, pe people want to play for winners they want to play in winning programs they want to feel like they have a chance to play professionally um you know we Vic law was on the orlando magic last year so now we had a guy who kind of cracked through and he was a local product mm -hmm. um, so it is very important to me you know and and certainly you know you're seeing a lot of other schools kind of come into the area and and attracts a lot of the top talent and that's always going to happen i mean it's chicago uh -huh. basketball so the big mm -hmm. boys are always going to come in mm -hmm. but if we can, if we can establish ourselves and be at least be an option for those players, um, and it takes me like I got to get out. I mean, that was important to me. I mean, I've known obviously the Irvin family. I played against Mike. I played, you know, uh, I've known Papa Irvin, you know, for as long. I mean, he meant a lot to me. Mama Irvin. I mean, they, you know, so you know, I feel hopefully that one of being a Chicago guy myself can help us because I think Chicagoans embrace their own. So if you see like mm -hmm. someone who's from here, you know, wanting to to establish themselves with local players, that's a start. And then we mm -hmm. got to continue to develop the relationships. We and the proof is in the pudding. You got to go out there and win. You know, mm -hmm. so if you're recruiting mm -hmm. when you're recruiting against these high level programs that that have a tradition of success. You can say, look, we're going to win too. And mm -hmm. so it's a great question because it's something that's very important to me. I I feel like there's enough enough talent at home where if you can get two, three guys each year, you can compete against anybody. And, I agree. Know, and that's something that we're trying to do with our recruiting. I agree. Once again, we're being joined by Northwestern men's head basketball coach, Chris Collins. And I got a quick follow-up to that. Recruiting today's athletes, a lot different than when you were recruited. Uh, a lot of them are looking for the flash and the splash, which, you know, that's not Northwestern typically. <laughs> but, you know, that's kind of what they're looking for. And so one of my buddies actually said, one of the things I'd love to see Northwestern do is do something with their uniforms because their colors, that purple and white, can really pop. But what your football team did, they made the, the doggone thing black. So yeah. I'm like, what are y'all doing? So we know you all are Under Armour school. Is that something that you actually have to consider as a basketball program? You know, making that purple pop when we see you on TV, Chris. I agree with that you know one of the things we've done the last couple of years and it's been a big hit we've actually had the players for our senior game we let the senior club the last three years have allowed our senior class to design their own jersey hmm. and that's been a big thing they've you know they take what they've liked from pro jerseys from other colleges different color schemes you know we we have worked a black jersey in now we have a gray but you guys know it's a big deal like even with under you know when when steph curry got hot 
that helped us uh-huh. you know, you know, for a while. You know, it's like, man, Under Armour, they don't have any star players. They don't, you know, we want to wear the Jordans. We want to wear the Adidas, whatever it was. Then mm-hmm. all of a sudden the best player in the world is wearing Under Armour. You know, so now the 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 Steph Curry's, you know, are a little bit more acceptable. So, you know, it's it's all as you guys know, it's it's all about, you know, it doesn't take much for something to get cool or something to get in, you know, and, and I think a lot of it goes hand in hand. Like our uniforms will look cooler if we're better. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got great players wearing those uniforms, like they're gonna look cooler if somebody's <laughs> dropping 30 and getting dunks and, and all those things. So it's funny how that works. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I think in today's age with social media and the cool, like all that, you have to stay on top of all that stuff with, with Twitter and Snapchat. And my kids are on this TikTok thing that I'm trying <laughs> to figure out now. So they got me dancing on TikTok and all these different. So, but you have to, 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 cause you have to relate to these young people. These, these are the young people you're recruiting that you want to come play for you. So you gotta, you, that's one of the things I learned from, Coach K that I think he's done a masterful job with is as he's gotten older, he hasn't been set in his ways, mm-hmm. you know, and very adaptable and flexible to change him with the times. And I mean, now, you know, all the one and dones, I mean, Duke forever, like Duke was the last program that really yep. had guys leave early. Yep. You know, now they got three, four, one and dones per year, you know, and that mm-hmm. was coach K kind of changing his philosophy. And so I, I think I've kind of learned from him. You got, you got to adjust, you got to be adaptive, you got to be flexible. And, and, and certainly in today's day and age, you got to keep up with these young guys. If you, if you want to stay relevant with them. You, you know what, Chris, I'm sitting there smiling because they had the other day they had on versus they had Jeezy versus Gucci. So I'm sitting there watching it, trying to make sure I'm watching it. Yeah. So the players and I, so we could talk about that. And excuse my cousin, Chris. He, he had the nerve to sit up and say, Chris, when you were recruiting, it changed. Yes, he has changed, but I didn't want you to think he was calling you old, Chris. <laughs> I don't want you to think that. Well, but, plus, but, to your point, you know, Lance, to your point, like I was more with the baby face versus Teddy Riley, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My guys are looking at me like, what are you talking about? I'm like, those two guys, that's where it's at. You know what, Chrissy? That's why I wanted to have you on the show because I tell people, I said, look, Chris has a great personality. I said, I really love Chris. But one thing I don't envy you about right now, Chris, your conference is a dog eat dog oh, conference. Don't I remind me. You had like six rated in the top 25. So talk to me about how you guys plan on getting better. I think over the past couple of years, you you were young last year. Yes. And then one year, I think your point guard hurt you. But talk to me how you think the team will fare this year. Yeah, I, I think we're much better. But to your point, you know, you play in a conference where there's six to eight teams in the top 25, four in the top 10 preseason. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like that's the part of the Big Ten. Like you can get better but not be making a whole lot of ground because everybody's really good. So – you know, I, I think what we have to do is stick to what's good for us. You know, we got to get back to uh, – we lost a lot of close games last year, which hurt us. When we've been good, we've been really good in those situations. And those can be really big confidence builders, you know, winning a close game against a high-level team versus losing. And it can kind of put you into a tailspin. So, you know, one of the things that I kind of learned after my first year was trying not to look at the schedule – pass like the next game in front of you because when you play in the Big Ten, you can look at about 8, 10, 12 games in a row and physically get sick, you know, <laughs> saying to yourself, as coach, you know this, Land, you kind of look at the schedule sometimes and you're like, who are we going to beat? <laughs> this, is, this is not looking good. So, you know, what what we I've tried to do is just, you know, play the next game in front of us. You know, I, I think we have more experience. We played a lot of young kids last year. I got six of my top seven returning. We added a couple freshmen that I think are really going to help us. And, you know, I think we have a chance. The one thing that's good about playing in a, in, in a league like the Big Ten, we have 14 teams. Last year, probably nine to ten of those teams were going to go to the tournament, mm-hmm. you know, before everything hit with COVID. So it's not like you have to win the league to, to go to the postseason. You know, you have to win enough. You have to put a resume together where, you know, you can be in that top half to give your, you know, it's because getting it's it's getting the invitation to the dance is the hardest part. Once you get there, everybody's got a shot. You see crazy things happen. So, 
you know, we got we got to climb a couple rungs on the ladder this year, and and I think our guys are poised to do that if things break right for us. You know what? How is Nance doing, Chris? That plays for you. Like a couple of years ago, I thought he was primed to really have a breakout season. So, how is he doing for you this year? Yeah, he's going to be a junior. Pete Nance. You know, for those that don't know, he's the son of. Uh, Larry Nance, you know, mm-hmm. the great Cleveland Cavalier and his brother, Larry Nance Jr. is currently on the, in the Cavs. So, mm-hmm. you know, you got a guy who's kind of grown up in a basketball family, a brother and a father who are pros. And I think early in his career, he kind of felt the pressure of that, okay. you know, and I, and I thought, you know, he was putting a lot of pressure on himself to try to do more to kind of be, you know, live up to his name, you know, and I think last year at the end of the season, he, he played really well down the stretch the last six to eight games. He's had a good offseason. He's gotten stronger. And to your point, he's starting his junior year. And, and sometimes, you know, like we're so into instant gratification. Like mm-hmm. sometimes it just takes some time with kids. You know, they got to mm-hmm. figure it out. They got to learn. They got to get stronger. They got to figure out how to be successful at the college level. And, and for him, I think it's taken him that time. And I'm excited about him. He's 6'10". He's long. He can shoot mm-hmm. threes. He's athletic. He's kind of that modern big guy now that can play all over the floor. Right. And, you know, for us to be good, we need him to be good. There's no question about it. And I'm excited to see what he can do this year. Coach Chris, uh, let me ask you this. For you personally, you know, growing up, you know, Glenbrook North, going there for school, Evanston not far away, Northwestern, you get to come back to be the head coach at Northwestern University. What – is this like your dream job for you from a coaching aspect or, I mean, can it get any better? Yeah. I mean, it, it was the perfect situation. You know, for me, I always wanted, I, I did not want to be somewhere where I wanted to go somewhere. I was at Duke, you know, I was, yeah. I, was I had a good gig. Yeah. You know, I went there, we were winning big. I was coaching great kids, love being with coach K, you know, so to leave there, it had to be something that I felt was a perfect fit for me. And you know, Chicago, I've always loved Chicago. Like it just, it fits me. Like I, ever since I moved here when I was 13, Chicago became my home. It's a sports city. It's a basketball city. Um, it's, you know, where I went to high school and to be able to bring my family back to the area where I grew up and kind of have a similar upbringing to coach at a school like Northwestern that has great academics, plays in the big 10 at the highest level, um, and it was home, like for me, like it didn't get any better than that. And, and I like, I like challenges, mm-hmm. you know, for me, I, I'm, they've never won before. So when people said, why would you go to a place that's never won before for me, that made it exciting. You know, I felt it was a place I could blaze my own trail and, you know, and, and go and, and make something happen and, and build a program at a place that has never seen winning. And I still believe that to be true. And I'm committed to being here long-term and, and making this my home. I mean, if this is as if if this is where I am my whole career, I would love that. Well said. I have one last question for you, Chris. It's kind of tough. It's gonna be the toughest question you're gonna get all night. <laughs> uh, Byron Irvin, Lance Irvin, Nick Irvin, Mac Irvin, Mike Irvin, Cindy Irvin. Which yeah. Irvin would you pick if you were playing in the game? You only yeah, have I, one one pick. I, I could only pick. Well, 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 Nick never passes the ball. <laughs> I would never pick Nick because he, he shoots every time. He <laughs> now, Mike, Mike had some point guard in him. You know, he had to play with Juwan back then. So, you know, and, and, and Antoine and those guys. So, you know, Mike, Mike would pass a little bit. You know, Byron, I like Byron's toughness. Like, you know, Byron, Byron had that toughness. You know, he had that size. He, he I think he'd set some good screens for me. <laughs> I, I think I think I go with Byron, even though I love them all. I love them all. I think I'll go with Byron. That's, that's a good pick. That's a good pick. I mean, Byron is the one that went to the NBA, Chris. So yeah. <laughs> I'm not stupid. I like talent. And <laughs> hey, hey, that's the first rule of the coaching. No, no, we got talent. And hey, we got one more question from one of our viewers. Can we put that question back up, Byron? One of our, our viewers had a quick question. Uh, for both coaches, want to talk about the difficulties in scheduling during this year and the need to be able to pivot quickly if a game gets canceled. You both have kind of experienced that. We got about a minute left. We both kind of um, just hit on that topic real quick on what it's like. I like Chris. Go, go ahead, Chris. I just right. hope Chicago State shows up on <laughs> December 5th or whenever we're supposed to play them. Not because not they – it's 
<laughs> I just don't know. I mean, li literally, I mean, we, we have games, you know, we all are waiting for that call. You saw today. I mean, there were how many yeah. games were canceled two days before the first game. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all like hoping and praying, fingers crossed that everybody can stay healthy. We all want to play, but to your point, we have to stay flexible. And I think all of us kind of, you saw what Lance did, like he, he lost the DePaul game or whatever. And all of a sudden they picked one up in one day. You got to do right. I mean, it's, you got to be ready. Chris, I had Friday, y'all last Friday, guys, no lie. I had Dayton, Duquesne, it went from Dayton, Duquesne, Western Illinois to Illinois, North Carolina, and Ohio in a matter of fit. In a matter of four hours, my schedule had wow. changed. In so, four hours, it changed. I know. It's, that's. I think we just have to be flexible this year. It's a year unlike any other. You know, we're seeing that it's going to be different. Let's just try to do what we can to get as many games in and keep safe. We got to keep these players safe. I mean, at the end of the day, we're in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got we got to stay safe as coaches. We got to stay safe for our families, for the players. And but we also understand if we can get out there and play, like it brings a lot of smile to people's faces to be able to turn on games and watch basketball. How fun was it to watch the bubble? You know, yeah. the NBA, I mean, it gave us something to do in a really tough time. So hopefully we can keep this thing going and uh, and get out there and play some games and 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 make the most of it this year in a tough time. Man, Chris, appreciate it. And our producer Maya, she went to Iowa. And I don't know, Chris, she just talks crazy about Iowa being <laughs> Northwestern. And she was supposed to jump on the screen and ask you a question, but she got scared because, you know, I told her I'm taking Northwestern over Iowa. So not well, well, oh, I told, I told you about this. Chris, by the way, I made no such comment. About I made no such comment. Everybody knows. I put Iowa, but everything. So the seven Big Ten teams in the top 25, there are three in the top 10, and yes. Iowa is ranked the highest at five. They I'll are. exit on that. You be quiet, Lance. Yeah, they they got the reigning national player of the year, Luca Garza. They got everybody back. It's going to be a tough out. So we, we better lace them up tight that night. <laughs> All guys are going to be tough this year. I know that for sure. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Coach Chris. Best of luck to you. Please keep yourself and your family and, 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 and all your players safe. Say hello to your dad to us. He was always so great to our family. And it was just a pleasure and honor to have you come on and join us on our podcast. But I got to kick you off because the next person is coming on to talk about the fight in the line now. Your rivals. So yeah. <laughs> I got to I got to get a line now, fan nation. They they tied, but they gonna be out. <laughs> Chris on. Yeah, appreciate you guys, Thanks, man. Chris. Happy holidays. Be safe. You Same. too. Thanks, we'll be Chris. right back you with take. my guy Kendrick Prince. We're gonna talk some fight in the line now. Hoops coming up. Stay with us on What's Up, Cubs. African Americans here and across the country are contracting coronavirus at higher rates than others. People of color and those with underlying health conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, and asthma are being hit hard. Please protect yourself and your family. Wash your hands often. Clean and disinfect frequently touched items. Wear a cloth face covering in public places like the grocery store where it's hard to social distance. More importantly, stay at home as much as possible. Your safety and the safety of our community depends on it. You see me, you hear me. Respect me. Respect. Do regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. We all have to agree, but I deserve to be heard. I stand my ground. Respect me. We don't have to be friends, but I deserve your civility. I stand my ground. Respect me. You don't have to understand my culture, but I deserve to be authentically myself. I stand my ground. Respect me. I stand in defiance of your need to make me less in order for you to feel adequate. I stand. I stand aware that the America that you see and love today is a result of my free labor. I stand. 
I stand knowing that the contempt you have for me was not instigated by me, but perpetuated by the fear you have of me. I stand. I stand surviving your many attempts to emasculate me. Indeed, I thrive despite it. I stand realizing that you take many things from me, but I will not allow you to take my respect. I am a man. I am a proud man. I am a proud black man. I am authentically, undisputedly, unapologetically a proud black man. I am authentic, undisputedly, unapologetically a proud black man. I am authentically, undisputedly, unapologetically a proud black man. Respect me. I have done more than enough to deserve it. And still you withhold it. The bill is past due. You owe me. Respect me. Respect me. Respect me. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to What's Up Cuts. I'm your host, Jason Palmer, along with that man who's clapping the coach, Lance C. Irvin. What you think of the show so far, Lance? You know what great show. I love the energy, cuz. Just love the energy. See, Chris, Chris brought that fire. Mark was good. And your next guest, you've been talking about him for a couple of weeks. So I'm going to see if he can bring that heat to it tonight. Well, you know, you know, my thing is, you know, being a journalist 20 years, you know, I don't have a lot of friends who are in the media industry, basically because I, I mean, we usually are all competing against each other and, you know, we all got different ideas and stuff. And, you know, for me, one, I got to have someone who know what they're talking about. And this okay. dude does. And okay. the second thing is I got to have somebody who will argue with me, which he will. So, <laughs> okay, cause, I like that. Because I want somebody who can, you know, keep me on my square and make sure, you know, Jason, you're putting out the right information here. Because I can't stand when the media put out the wrong information because it makes all of us look bad. You it's know, so so me and this guy, you know, we we, we go out and Twitter sometimes, but we cool. We right there in the same way. <laughs> we we pulling on the same road. We just sometimes think, well, I want to go this way, kid. And he say, well, Jay, I'm going this way. But we cool like that. Okay. And I, like uh, that. I need someone who could talk about uh, the other Big Ten team in our state, the University of Illinois. And this dude, he bleeds blue and orange. Mm. And we got a bunch of family members that went down to U of I. I know mm. my cousin Lisa is probably watching out in California. Mm. My boy Daryl Crater is watching. Mm. You know, they want to know what's Mark going on. They fighting the lion eye. Mm. So we go not talk about Lovey Smith and the football team. <laughs> But we're going to talk about the hoop squad, and maybe I'll ask one lovely question at the end. But this hey, guy man. knows everything about U of I, every sport. He know the athletes. He know the coaches. So I said, I'm going to get someone who I know what they're talking about. And, you know, he's done so much. He's worked for rivals. He works. Uh, he does blogs. He writes for the, a lot of the, the organizations down there in Central Illinois. So I wanted to bring him to the show. My guy, Kendrick Prince. Okay, what's up, KP? Man, up, you, uh, what an introduction. A tough guy to follow. Chris Collins, <laughs> then you got an urban on here, man. You, you, and this is tough. Hey, man, <laughs> hey, man, that's why I put you in there, man. I know you can handle it, man. You know how coaches are. They think you couldn't handle it. We tough as on the ones, and we know we take it. I guess, man. I, I got to set my game up a little bit tonight. <laughs> KP, we brought you on here to close this thing out tonight. We brought you on here to close it out, talking about right. a lot now. Let's hit it. All right, well, let's just jump right into it. Basketball season getting ready to tip off on on uh, Wednesday, U of I. You know, they got their own tournament that they're hosting. Um, what are you expecting from this Illini team this coming season? This week, I expect to see blowouts. I mean, I'm, I would I want to see blowouts by 40 points or more. When Illinois was good in 1989 and in 2004 and 5, that 2004-5 season, they were blowing teams out by 40, 50 points. That's going to tell me how good they are. I don't want to see them come out and struggle. I don't want to see them come out and struggle shooting the basketball, defending people. This is a top 10 team nationally. Everybody has them in their top 10, top 12. The talent's there. 
long term, if we, they can stay healthy. I heard Chris Collins say before, I made a tweet. It's real funny you guys say that a couple minutes ago. I am not. I don't talk politics because I know where that ends. I've lost a lot of friends over politics. But I posted something a few minutes ago just saying, hey, do what you got to do. Just be safe. You know, basically wear a mask. I don't care what if you're a Democrat or Republican, I could care less. And as soon as I posted that, people got mad. But I'm going to tell you, Chris is right. You got to look out for the players and Coach Irvin. You know this as well. You can. I heard you say your schedule will change. You can lose games left and right. Illinois is supposed to play Baylor next week. I don't know if that's going to happen. So long term, this team is loaded. They're deep. I just want to see them finish it out. I thought they could have made a run last year. I really do. Mm-hmm. Now everybody coming back a year older with those incoming freshmen. I think the sky's the limit for them. And you know, I can't, and I'm like saying, because that's one of the things we actually debated about when this thing first happened. You know, you were and you were down at the Big Ten tournament, if I'm not mistaken, right. when everything jumped off. I had just left Indianapolis and I sent you a message like, yo, man, this coronavirus thing is serious, kid. I really would prefer if you didn't go to the game because everything is going on. You're like, well, they haven't canceled anything yet. And then like an hour later, you were like, okay, they just got us all out of here and they canceled everything. Uh, we've debated about this. I mean, everyone knows my position. I don't think the game should be played. However, I understand the games are going to be played for a lot of different reasons. Um, you are covering this sport. What type of protocols have they put in place for you this year to try to even cover the line? Are you going to be able to go to the game? What a press conference is going to look like? What is it going to be like for you trying to cover this team that's got all this potential this year? Okay, it's a great question. Usually when we apply to get our press credentials, you'll get a press credential for the whole season. And then you'll get a parking pass for the whole season. And then when you go sit at the press box in football games or a press row behind the, uh, behind the coaches and, you know, in the team, you sit right next to each other. That's not the case anymore. You have to apply game by game. You're sitting six feet apart. Um, I heard Deion Thomas talk about the other day because he does the radio, you know, uh, for the University of Illinois. He won't be on the floor. It's going to be a lot different. And and it's a culture shock because we can be really lazy and say, I don't have to go to the games because the university will provide us a link with all the stats. And then when the games are over with, everything's done on Zoom. Mm So I, I, me personally, I mean, I live three hours from Champaign. I live in the Quad Cities. And I'm going to drive down there, but realistically, I can sit home and do everything from my house now. So um, it's just – it's different. And, you know, I like being able to go to press conferences afterwards to talk to the players, to talk to the coaches, but now it's all on, on a computer. And it's – it's this coronavirus has changed everything. You know, if, if people don't understand it – and you're right, Lance, you and I agree on the same thing. You know, I was interviewed for a newspaper article, and I think people were upset with me. I'm about people staying alive. I love mm-hmm. sports. You said it right. I love sports, and I like it's, like it's my job. But I also want to see people live. KP, you killing me. You just killed me. Yo, Alana, please don't beat my Chicago State team by 40. <laughs> they can beat everybody else by 40, but I can't go that easy. I like you because you spoke it, though. Oh, that's I can't go that easy. easy. My fault. It don't matter. You know, I can't go that easy. Beat about fifty. Beat about fifty. See, now I'm gonna kick you. I'm gonna kick you off the show. No, <laughs> well, you know, we all know. We 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 all know they loaded, and uh, I think mm-hmm. that the tournament is gonna be a little bit tougher because some of the teams in there they they pick pretty high. But talk to me about what you think the team needs to do this year to get to the final four. Like last year, they were solid. I just this me. I thought the outside shooting needed to come around a little bit for them to win it all. What things you think they need to work on so they could get to the final four if there is a final four? Coach, I hate to put pressure on any two player, and I know it's not fair to do because I've coached high school and college myself. They need Adam Miller and Trent to shoot the ball. That's Ooh. just the people can overanalyze, and I'm not one of those coaches to where you know you overanalyze every little thing. But at some point in time, you have to make shots, and I think they struggle. And there was times when Illinois was lucky that Isle was good enough to create and get shots for himself. But there were so many times when, you know, Trent was one of the top three-point three shooters his freshman and sophomore year, and he struggled. Now you lose Alan Griffin, so Adam Miller's going to be that guy. I've not confirmed it, but I heard he may be the fifth guy in the lineup. But you always have to defend, Coach, and you know that. You know, you mm-hmm. have to. 
in and you have to rebound. But if you don't make shots, it's going to be tough for you to win, especially when teams are putting the ball in the basket. You know, Iowa, Iowa's a team that can score, you know, and if you don't shoot the ball well and score against them, it's going to be a long night. So long term, they can't go games where they're shooting 19% from the three. I think teams, if I was coaching against Illinois, even you, I'd zone them until they prove to me. That <laughs> because they have to prove that, seriously. They really do. They tried putting Georgia out there on the four. It didn't work out. So teams sagged off of them. And I'm telling you, the games that they lost, they didn't shoot the ball well. Uh-huh. You know, I call myself studying the game, right? <laughs> so I study the game. But I think the big game on their schedule in the next two weeks is the team you talked about, Baylor. It's yeah. some Baylor, it's some Jay, it's some bad guys yeah. at Baylor. And they chomping at the bits for that game, too. Both of them, it's like two top. Baylor's number one in the country. U of I, I think, is number one of, of five, excuse me. That right there, that's a game early on that's going to be a good matchup, I think. I like that. And I'll tell you what Coach Underwood, the thing I like about him, he said when he got his job, if he had a team, he would play anybody. It didn't, he would play 10 top teams in a row if he could. Now that he has the talent, I like the fact that he doesn't run from people because that lets you know where you need to work on and where you are, even if it's early on. You know, And I'll tell you what's good about this, for Illinois, like when they go to Duke or they play Baylor, there's no fans there. Mm-hmm. So really no, even though, you know, Baylor's out, you know, in Texas, it's really good because you don't have a home court advantage. So I like the fact that there's not a lot of fans there. And personally, the one guy I think this is really going to benefit from, I think it's going to benefit Io because that guy just – I've it's been a long time since I've seen a college kid want the game shots like he wants in the end of games. And I think by not having fans there, I think that's just going to make it easier for him. I really do. Mm. That was actually going to be my next question too, uh, KP. <laughs> Io, 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 how big of a deal was it – when you all found out Io was coming back because he had announced he was going to the league and then he announced he was coming back. What did that mean for this program that you were about? For me, okay, if you look at the games, I think it was six games he won at the buzzer. You take those six games away that he don't make the game-winning shot, they don't go to the tournament. They're not second in the Big Ten. He is a difference maker. And what I don't like is that some scouts, I mean, I'm glad he came back, but I think some scouts, are just, they they look for flaws. Every player in the NBA, I don't care who it is, and I'm the biggest Jordan fan there is, you know, they all have flaws for their game. And I think what Io did as a sophomore, when people knew he was going to be take the game, take the last shot, you knew he was the guy that won the ball in his hands. He's a game changer. And when people see him Wednesday, how much he's filled out. You know, you talk, you know, I talk to the coaches, you know, um, from time to time. His shot is even better. When he came out of high school, people said he couldn't shoot. Then he got better and got better. His work ethic is unbelievable. The guy is the face of the program. You know, when other kids decide to leave the state, you know, which I wrote my column about that last week, he stayed home and he's proven that you can win at Illinois. And I mean, he's a, he's a first team All American. So mm-hmm. him coming back is huge. He, he changes the whole dynamic of the University of Illinois basketball team this year. You know what? I, I went to go watch them last year and I practice, and I saw him in there lifting, and his body has changed. And I think everybody on their team, body has changed. But what do you expect out of Big Kofi this year? That's the equalizer in all this, right? And I think that I always tell people, okay, you have to make outside shots. But you need somebody who you could throw the ball to in the inside to get you two points and get the other team in foul trouble. What type of year do you expect out of him this year? I've been criticized a lot for, about Kofi because, to me, I think what separates him, I would talk about Isle. You talk, look at look at Luca Garza. That mm-hmm. guy, when, when the going gets tough, you can't stop him whether it's inside or outside. I think to get sure. Kofi going, he needs to develop – a shot where it's a go-to where this is my shot. I can get – I'm going to either score or I'm going to get fouled. I didn't see that last year he was able to, you know, power over people. I like to be able to see him with a turn and face, a jump hook, because people are going to play him differently this year. If he, if he thinks that people are going to allow him just to knock people over, that's going to change. You know, it's luckily he can shoot free throws. But mm-hmm. I really want to see him add more to his arsenal. I don't want to see him, you know, just – try to knock people over and try to dunk the basketball because that turnaround shot, 
you know, and there's a lot of bigs, you know, that can step out and shoot the basketball. And I think he can do it. And he said last year, Coach Underwood didn't want that from him. But I know the NBA teams want that. I know they want to see him. But in all honesty, to answer your question, Coach, he has to develop a go-to move, something where they throw the ball in the post, where regardless of what there's, because there's going to be games where Isles not on, where Adam Miller's not on, or Trent's not on, or Demonte Williams. So that's what I want to see from him. Yeah, and the thing you know what I want to see from Kofi this year? Don't be knocking out my fellow referees like he did last year, man. You know, <laughs> you know I was thinking the other day. I was thinking. What was the funniest thing I saw last year? And I remember that. That was, I mean, can you imagine how bad that felt? Oh, <laughs> I missed that. Oh, he, he accidentally did. clubbed I the referee. It. I missed he, it. Was, he was celebrating. It was after a shot or N1 or some, something like that. Yes. And he took his hand like he was going to just wave to the crowd and knock the official out. Boom. Not do that. I was like, oh, my God. He just knocked my fellow official out, man. What in the world, Kobe? You know, you can see he was so apologetic. Everybody felt so bad. I was texting. Can't you like, is the dude all right? You're like, they taking him off in the stretcher. <laughs> yeah, man, that was rough. So let me ask you this about, about you, Vi. We got a few more minutes left in the segment. What is the what is the uh, environment like down there on the campus um, about this scene? You know, what is the kind of feeling maybe you're getting um, from the student body? Are they really excited about this team, you know? Because uh, I know U of I fans can be really fickle. Um, and the first thing they go wrong, they're ready to jump off the, the ledge, so to speak. <laughs> what is it like down there? People are really, really excited. It's been a long time. You know, the older people around my age, we remember when it was Bruce Douglas and Ken Norman and all those Ephraim, legends. Ephraim Marcus, Winters. Ephraim Winters. Uh, you know, Derek Harper. We remember those days. And then, you you know, you struggle, and then you get the 89 team, then the 05 team. The new generation, I don't think they really understand. You know, to, to answer your question is the fans are excited, but the ones, the OGs, the guys that have been around a long time, they know. They really, really want to see Illinois basketball be back. Because it is. It's one of the best high school – it's been the best high school states in the world for high school basketball. And there's no reason – Illinois should not be in the tournament, whether it be Chicago State, Northwestern, you know, Illinois Bradley, Illinois State. Somebody ha from this state needs to be in the tournament. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, or even DePaul. You know? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, because it matters. It really does. There's no reason for it. The basketball is too good here for that. KB, uh, I said that I said that earlier today on the Sean and Meyer show. I said there's no excuse for the state of Illinois not to have at least a minimum of three to four teams yep. making the NCAA tournament every year with the tournament we got. Yes, I mean, and, and with all the talent, and and some years, you know, it's bad. You know, it goes mm -hmm. in cycles. But then that's when you, you know, that's when you go out of state. I will give you know, Coach, you know, Underwood and Coach Smith credit. They do try to recruit the state hard. And then at some point in time, you have to go out the state because kids aren't going to stay home. This mm -hmm. isn't the 80s anymore. It, it, it is what it is. I understand it. It's hard, you know, to accept. Um, fan base, I tell you right now, you put anything on Twitter right now about Illinois, and I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna get a hit. People are excited, they are really, really excited about Illinois basketball, and the state needs that. I think the country needs that right now, to be honest with you. But, but you know what? Think about what you and Jason just said in the 80s and 90s, we were staying home to play, right? Nowadays, if it's a little bit different, like they hit lightning when Iowa State because prior to Iowa. People was leaving here left and right. Yeah. That's the thing that makes it hard. But with that being said, I'm going to say we do need to have a couple of teams from the state to make the NC2A tournament. But it's tough out here when people coming in and out raiding your, raiding your state. I'm not even going to say raiding your state. But nowadays, it's an arms race. Like yeah, everybody has now. You got Duke. Chris was just on here. Chris was a player of the year. He went mm -hmm. to Duke. Mm -hmm. You had Sean Levinston. So, mm -hmm. you know, shout out to Adam and Io for staying home. Right. That, you know what? That's tough. So with that being said, I do think they prime to have a great season this year. Do you think they as good as the 89 team was or the 2005 team? Because the 89 team, all local talent, and they had some guys. I'm going to tell you, 89 to me was at a different level. I Kendall Gills had the best analogy. He said, I interviewed him once, and he says, Kendrick, let me ask you something. If you go by position by position, tell me that team had one guy 
that was better, and that was Dan Williams. Everybody else in that A19, and then you have Marcus Liberty coming off the bench and Larry Smith, who was a McDonald's All American. That A19 was special. They were loaded. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks Jay. for joining us, my guy, Kendrick Prince. He but finally wait. jumped on here. Oh, Jay, but wait, wait, Jay. I'm what? not letting you off the hook that oh, evening. What? Who are you taking? What team you taking? Uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think the, 80, know. the 89 team is just close to my heart. And if they had some ballers, man, you know, until somebody, it's kind of like the 85 Bears, until <laughs> somebody else come and win it, you kind of got to go, you know, with them. I mean, they went far in 05, don't get me wrong, but I, I think the 89 team. Right? There was I mean. a player on that team that could guard Nick Anderson. Nobody could guard Nick. And sure. that's where I look a at it. Matchup nightmare. Yes, he will. Without was. a doubt, without a doubt. KP, man, thank you so much for joining us, man. You did so well, man. And uh, I'm hoping Illinois has a really strong season so that we can have you back. You are our guy down there. Um, and, you know, I hope we're talking again in March when they're in the final four, man. So thank you so much for doing this. And please be very safe down there. I know yeah. how much you love the sports and how much you're going to get out there and try to get that coverage for us. But please be safe. And I wish thank you and you. your family the best, man. You too. I'll see you this week, Coach. Appreciate okay. it, KP. Thank All right. you. That's my guy, Kedrick Prince, talking about fighting the lion. Now, we're coming towards the end of our show here, Lance, and uh, uh, the big holiday is coming up. Let me just ask you, what are your plans for Thanksgiving? Because this year, I am not coming over to see your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, cuz. Uh, you know, it's different this year because, you know, Paul was like, well, you know, the family not coming over, so you want me to cook? I said, no, I want you to cook. <laughs> like, why are you asking me that? Yeah, you, you go cook. Yeah, so a couple of sweet potato pies, but, I mean, it's going to be different this year, Jay, right? You know, you can't have family. But with that being said, man, we all should be thankful that we're still here. Yes. You know, this COVID is real. You know, we lost my aunt from COVID. So I just want everybody to be safe and be thankful. And let's use this year to come out better than what we had been coming out because, man, it's tough, Jay. So I'm thankful we all still here, but I'm thankful my wife is going to make some sweet potato pies. <laughs> well, I, my pies. I bad at you. My so pies. my wife and I, we, we were discussing our Thanksgiving menu yesterday. <laughs> so we said, well, just the two of us, I guess we don't really need as much stuff as usual. So we basically compromised with, with items that we just absolutely had to have. Which so I, I think we decided on collard greens, uh huh. I told sweet that. potato, mac and cheese, and then because she doesn't eat meat, uh, I'm going to end up getting some cooked turkey breast from somewhere, and I don't know what type of meat she's gonna come up with. And I said I'll make a key lime pie. That's it. So <laughs> that's what we gonna go with, and that better last us for two days. But you know, and all that dressing and all that stuff you gotta make, man. Ain't nobody going through all that, man. Hey, so. Jay, Ricky told Ricky told Paula, can you make some crab? Mac, can you make some crab macaroni and cheese? <laughs> Woo, that go. stuff on fire. So we'll see. There you go, baby. There you go, man. That's what we got to do this year, man. So you know, we'll be back next week to talk sports again. Uh, once again, don't forget download that app. Yes, download sir. the Sports Zone Chicago app on Instagram, on Amazon. Um, you can get it. Please download that app. It's really important for us. Also, subscribe to us on YouTube if you're watching us on YouTube. But just tell everybody, we're on every Monday from 6 to 8 p.m. And make sure you tune in. And we have a new Twitter page where it's you and I. So finally, we got our Twitter page up. And you can go there and look at past shows as well. Um, it's, It's current shows. So just go on there. Check us out. Follow us. Please follow us, promote us, retweet us, do all that good stuff. We can really blow the show up so we can really bring you more top-notch guests. So for my cousin, Lance C. Irving, and our super producer, Maya Kai, we bid you all a very safe and happy Thanksgiving with only the two of you. Wear your mask. (laughs) (laughs) Peace out, y'all.